And it's recording. Don't worry about the guitar. I'm just holding it like a blankie. It's, oh, it yeah, makes me, sure. It makes, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Security blanket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the way to do it. Jonathan. Maybe let me turn the lights on. Hold on. It's pretty yeah. dark, right? So you just had an incident where your puppy ate your exercise mat? A little piece of it, yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> the dog is tiny. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, man. There's so much I want to ask you. So from what I know about you, you started off playing professionally pretty young, right? You were doing, you were making money playing music from like what age? Yeah, probably my first, my first gigs were probably around uh, 14, I think, or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was, uh, let's see, the I remember the first like, well, of course, you know, I did the thing that all the kids do, like playing rock bands at, at like Battle of the Bands and all that kind of stuff. You know, I was doing that maybe even younger, 13, 14, I'm around there. But around that same time, uh, there was a, a teacher at a place where I was studying who was kind of like one of these dudes who do, they don't even exist anymore. These kind of guys <laughs> like, like he would play this kind of. Uh, I want to say organ, but it wasn't like. You know, now I play with Dr. Lonnie Smith. It wasn't like a B3 organ. It was like one of these, like, you could program like a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, he would, and he would play all these tunes, like standards, basically, and pop songs. But they were all, like, his own changes. <laughs> they weren't... <laughs> like, over the, over the beats inside they the keyboard? They, just, they were just like, yeah, yeah, basically. So he would... And then he just realized that, he, okay, I was talented and I had good ears and I would make up stuff, you know? Like, we were jamming one day in, you know, after my lesson or something. And he was like, oh, this kid, you know... So he probably realized, like, oh, I can get him to do these gigs. Ah. And he'll probably work for pretty cheap. And he sounds pretty good on these <laughs> tunes. So, so, so basically... Your first, just, your, yeah. your first gig was subbing for the Casio. Well, no. So he would play the Casio... <laughs> <laughs> and he would sing and play, and and I would be like the soloist. I'd play some chords, but I I'd, I'd take solos. Oh, so it was like pretty quickly I was improvising. You know, I always you know yeah. that was the kind of thing I liked to do anyway. So it, it kind of for me it was actually a good exercise because he had some tunes written down, but a lot of them he would just start playing, and I'd have to learn them by ear. You know, so it was this experience that I think back in the old days a lot of guys had where they would play gigs and they'd learn by ear and then they have to make up something like early jazz you know or even mm -hmm. or even a lot of like guys like chet baker i think like they learned that way you know by ears being in the moment and having to listen so for me it, it actually even though it was all the wrong chords and stuff it was like you know he would like simplify tunes so like he would take like you know uh some type of standard like sunny or something and then he would just kind of like Instead of a two five, there'd just be a big five chord or something like mm -hmm. that. So it's slightly corny, but it was like, you know, I could hear it and try and figure it out. And at that point, I didn't really process things as, you know, my music theory was getting there, but it was more like just being in the moment and listening. So those experiences were really good for me, actually, I think. Um, and I think that kids don't get those kind of experiences these days. Very rare. You know? Well, it's funny, on this feed, I, you know, you're actually the first of your kind. Uh, I don't know how actually, if you have a kind, you're, you're kind of a unique guy, but, uh, <laughs> but most of the people that have been here so far have been either really far in the fusion side, like we had Oz Noy and John Etheridge and people like that, and uh, a lot of the gypsy guys, like Gizmo right. Graf and the gypsy jazz people, which tend to think they all have that experience kind of on steroids, because, you know, they, they're... Um, sitting there with their parents playing like these legs oh, yeah, again and yeah. again and again <laughs> yeah that's almost two polar opposites the, the gypsy guys and the fusion guys you know because the fusion guys usually are coming from a very theoretical mm -hmm. type scholastic place you know but they have rockers in them in their souls so then they end up coming to terms with those two things and that's fusion you know but the gypsy mm -hmm. guys for sure they're they're such it's such a language oriented thing that it's really like passed down you know it's incredible to yeah when you talk when you hear the way they describe learning music well they don't describe it they don't describe anything they're like it's natural to me that's the phrase yeah, yeah. you keep you keep hearing and you know but that's I why it's that, such a freaky thing when you hear someone like one of uh, a guy that used to be in my workshops when I would go to Finland um, who's now just freaking people out is this kid Oli do you know Oli oh, he was a, on the street yeah. Yeah, he's a man now, you know, and he's yeah. a bad mother, you know. Yeah. And and he doesn't come from that 
tradition, you know. He grew up in right. Finland, in a town in Finland, which I think that's so beautiful when you get someone like that who is – you know, coming from a different background and they somehow assimilate this other thing, you know, mm-hmm. it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird because thinking about your playing and where you're standing in kind of the history of jazz, I, I like to think about it like almost like there, there are archetypes in jazz and like, you know, Louis Armstrong is kind of like the entertainer kind of dude. And Charlie Parker is more like the classical music virtuoso and John Coltrane kind of is more, you know, brought into this realm of spirituality. And like, you know, your generation of people and the thing you do, it's it's almost like a, I don't what they call like the end of history kind of thing where you're just standing standing above it and summarizing. That that's that's the feeling. Wow, where, that's that's cool. I, I never heard it described that way. But it's very similar to something that I once said in an interview, which was and it was like a little epiphany I had while I was talking about it. And I realized like th- there's the only thing I can describe about what's going on now. And, you know, what I somehow set out to do 20 years ago or something was that there's been a lot of amazing music that almost set out to do something through the process of rejecting certain things. And that was really important. And, and a lot of great music has come from that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like if you want to look at, you know, you know this is a blanket statement and it's never 100% this. But, but you know, if you look at, at something like, you know, even early jazz, they were, they were saying, okay, we're going to, we're not going to just play what's written. We're going to, mm-hmm. we're going to converse about it. So in a way they were rejecting this classical way of thinking in the beginning, you know, and and it was a folk music, really. It was like let's 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 just improvise around this thing, and it, and it of course happened gradually. But then you had Charlie Parker come along, and they and you know, or even you could say you could even say that 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 was you know swing music happened, and then Charlie Parker came along, and they kind of rejected that, and he said, okay, we're gonna we're not we're gonna play the unobvious notes, and we're not mm-hmm. gonna just play this straight four on the floor rhythm, and they in a way it was a rejection of what happened before, which is why guys like Louis and some of the earlier guys didn't like them that much, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was, you know, and if you go through time, you know, fusion music in a way, it was also, it was a rejection of acoustic music. It was like, screw that. Exactly. You know, we're not going to get quiet. We're just gonna, was, you know, we're going to throw this stuff down, you know? It was a timbral rejection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that music couldn't have been what it is without doing that, you know? Well, what are you rejecting? Well, th- that's what I realized was that um, that's not what I'm doing. Like, like I, I, you know, I grew up playing all these different types of music and, you know, you could argue that what I'm doing maybe isn't as revolutionary as those things were. But for me, what it is, is it's it's actually something that I ended up finding a kindred spirit in with Lonnie Smith when I started playing with him, which is this idea that you can study bebop and study even Baroque music and the ideas of music but also listen to groove music and world music and, and have all this stuff. So in a way that's like fusion in a way, cause we're putting things together, but in a way we're doing it without rejecting anything. We're, we're keeping, we're keeping the acoustic elements and the dynamics of jazz. We're keeping the attention to the language and the swing, but then mm-hmm. we're also letting it be open to like psychedelic things, funk things, all kinds of other stuff. So in a way, that's that's what I realized was my mantra in a way at some point. Well, I think like you don't re- you specifically don't reject anything rhythmically and harmonically, but you do you definitely you know come. I, I mean, I heard you say it like you know that you come from Alan Holdsworth and you know Van Halen in terms of re- early influence. So at a certain point, you definitely rejected timbrally, you know, where I guess guitar went. Right. Oh, I there's see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be true. But then again, like, I don't know. There's some albums and some tunes where you hear me playing with a really <laughs> straight ahead guitar tone. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. something that you don't do if you're really rejecting, you know? So mm-hmm. I guess that's what I mean is like, actually, I did do that too. And I do that. I mean, there's a, 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 a clip I put on recently on, you know, my wife finally got me to join Instagram a year ago or so. <laughs> You know, I put and I put a clip up of me playing with Lonnie, which is pretty much like a, a like my approach to a to a, a traditional organ trio with a straight sound and everything. And and uh, I I find a challenge in being able to work within pre- parameters and still be yourself. You know, that's oh really, yeah. You know, well, that's, well, yeah. So in a way, 
I mean, yeah, so, you know, that, then again, I mean, you know, everybody can do do that to a certain extent. But uh, but yeah, no, I never felt like I had like a really strong rejection of anything except mediocrity. You know, I just I just can't stand things that are too derivative and too trying to sound like you're you're just doing that thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I have to find some way to tweak it and make it my own. You know, that's yeah. You and, know. and a con- it's funny. It's uh. We, I had a conversation with, with John Etheridge, and he was talking about the period in the late 70s where fusion was starting to become stale, right? right. Where everybody who yeah. was doing it was like, all right, uh, you know, it's a, it's already a style. We don't, yeah. no, nobody wants to do it now. And then, and, and then Holdsworth came along. And then Holdsworth, yeah, and then Holdsworth came along. What the? And fucked everybody up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how'd you get into him? And, and what was that like? How deep did you get into him? Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, that was... Pretty early, uh, um, believe it or not, like yeah, like I don't, I don't really have. I had, I had a couple self-imposed periods where I worked very seriously on a certain um, style, you know. Uh, but, but a lot of stuff was very concurrent. Like, like when I think back, like the time I got into Holdsworth was not that far away from the time I got really deep into bebop. You know what I mean? Mm. It's not like it was in a really different period of my life or anything. Um, hmm. you know, I, I, I found Holdsworth probably my senior year of high school. A friend of mine played me road games Yeah, uh, and we actually played on my senior recital of high school. I guess we played Tokyo dream, Nice. Um, which somewhere there's a video of that. And, and I can't anyway. imagine. I can't imagine that somehow. But uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna no, Google it. It's so no, it's not on YouTube <laughs> or anything. I mean, it's it's like a private video. But actually, if I found it, I would I would send it to you. I mean, I was actually pretty surprised, um, because I don't know about about you, but we're getting to an age. I, I assume you we're probably not that far off. Um, where you have certain lifetimes in your within your life, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, oh like, yeah. Like like, uh, like for instance, here's another perfect example. So last night I played with. Uh, Actually, a great, great Israeli bass player, Or Barakat, played on the gig mm-hmm. last night, and uh, and I, I thought maybe he doesn't know Dolphin Dance, so let me let me put together a chart because we, we we I hadn't played that in years. And I heard a version the other day. I said, "Oh, that's a great tune." So I went and I kind of uh, listened to Herbie's version. I always do that because I don't trust real books. I don't really of use course. books, but I, so I listened to, to the changes and I made some little notes and then I went and said, oh man, I don't want to write it out. Let me just copy it out of the old real book. And I took it and all the notes that I had written about Herbie's little intricacies on the old real book chart were exactly the same as what I had written on my paper. And I don't remember doing it at all. So it's That's like, hilarious. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> when I'm on tour, I take Ambien sometimes, which probably doesn't help with my, memory, you know, but <laughs> didn't, uh, do, didn't do good things to Razan. Careful what you say on social media. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, with her, the, the the true beast probably came out. With with me, <laughs> mine would be a lot more tame. But uh, but uh, yeah. So so uh, it's interesting when you realize that you've lived uh, these different things. Um, and and I had a similar feeling when I watched the Holdsworth thing. Uh, because because I kind of nailed the head and stuff like, and I don't even remember learning that's a hard thing to play. You know. Oh, of course. Tapping. Yeah. But yeah, so I was really into to that. At that age, I was, you know, there's something that you have when you're young that changes as you get older, and it's good and bad. You know, I mean, it's it's a different energy. I was just, I would get so obsessed with things that I would just, just, just play them and listen and play and listen and, until the point where I thought that I approximated it. You know what I mean? What happens now? What was now, now? I think I get a lot more intellectual about stuff. You know, I try and analyze, and that has a good side too. Like mm-hmm. for instance, I had a lot of things that I did early that were technical, that were cool, but then I had other things that were like really bad habits. You know, mm. I ended up having some tendonitis later. You know what I mean? Uh, so because those things you just don't think about, you just keep doing it. You know, and and you know, also as a composer, you, you eventually start to analyze things in a way yeah. that's different than when you're a kid and you just, oh, this, this sound, it's this, it's this, you know. Uh, and now I'm really a little more of a composer in a way. So I think when I hear something, I immediately am trying to analyze it. You know what I mean? Mm. So well, I'm actually not sure what you mean. It seems to me like you're very much an improviser. In, in what way are you more of a composer? Y- yeah, well, uh, 
just more aware, like you know what you're doing, so well, for it's one less thing, surprising. I, mean, I, I write better music now, so I mean, that's part of, you know, composed, as a composer, I think I've always grown, you know. Um, but I think also, in a way, even though I've always improvised, I improvise in a very compositional way. You know, there's a great Wayne Shorter quote where he says, improvising is composing sped up and composing is improvising slowed down, which is, yeah. you know, they're not that far away. But, but you know, uh, um, I guess I just mean there there is something to be said about this energy you have when you're young. Mm. It, it, it's I mean, it's scientifically proven, and I have theories about what genius is and that it has something to do with with a, a child uh, an infant stage that gets held over into adult life you know or at least mm. young adult life you know um, yeah because, because actually there's proof that that infants take things in and learn things at a at a much much higher rate than adults like something like 30 times you know like you know the first sure. year, the amount of information that's processed even though the it's a baby and the baby doesn't talk. It's actually brain is functioning on a much higher level than yours is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because, so, of, you know, the, what, the amount of it that's being used, you know. When did you start feeling that that kind of energy, I guess, starting to shift in your I, I, I don't I don't know. That's tough. That's tough. But I've, I've read yeah. little, little things over the years from different people that just that struck me that way. Like, I, 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 I love like Bob Dylan's first couple records. I think the lyrical aspect, along with mm -hmm. his playing is really genius yeah and then you, a shift happens a little later where it just just changes and then and i always thought that and then i mean of course he started playing with a band which was a big difference but it even was a little earlier maybe something just you know happened and i read an article once and he said yeah you know people asked me so many questions and they and they wondered why i always answered with these cryptic answers during that period of those first few years his first few albums and he said the truth of the matter is I don't know what was happening. He said, it was, it, sometimes I think I was possessed by something. Like I just felt something. And, you know, there's there's concerts of him where he improvised tunes based on the newspaper headlines that day. And he's playing, mm -hmm. singing, coming up with all these, you know, clever lines and stuff. So it's like, you know, I think you could say, okay, yeah, maybe he's possessed by something. Or maybe it was this, this childish thing held over, you know. Yeah. I, and I, I just had... I use the word childish, not like childish, like, oh, yeah, little child. I mean, as an honorary, childish is actually can be a, a beautiful. It's very interesting you say that, you know, like I was talking to John Etheridge and he was talking about Eric Clapton. And he said that, like, in, there were two years in the 70s where he was just, you know, playing guitar through a Marshall for the first time and really singing through it. And he said the genius can pass through people. Yeah, but talent always stays, and he was always right. a talented dude. But for those two years, he was a genius. Yeah, he's probably yeah. talking about Cream, right, with the SG. But, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like before that when he was just playing clubs in London when he started, right. like as a kid, right. you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that. That's I mean, I think Leonard Cohen's pretty similar to Bob Dylan, to where they were like these first couple of records where they were just yeah, it just flows. There's a flow thing, you know, and I think some some people continue that and it just you have to it changes and it becomes something else which can be great too but it's just there is something to be said about that um and uh i don't know for, for me I, I i can't say it was anything like that but i can say that that i did have some kind of especially like uh the chameleon thing for me was really interesting like you know i have one record that goes back from my miami trio before i moved to new york and did trioing Trioing is the first one I know, so yeah, what so, happened before so, that? So you would crack up if you heard that, you know. Well, what uh, what what happened? <laughs> well, well, that was the one before that was that was when I was just doing this obsessive kind of thing that I can't explain, where I would just get into certain players and I would really process it in my own way, you know. So so basically, uh, on that record is the closest anyone probably would hear of me playing. So you had, you had like a Schofield and an Ingve and. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I can even uh, like in, at the time I really had no idea that this was happening. But now when I listen to it, I completely can can listen to it. And I say the first tune, Holdsworth for sure. You know, the second uh -huh. tune uh, is probably like Schofield. You know, the third tune is probably like Steve Vai. You know, uh, and that's three of my major influences. You know, and then the fourth yeah. is like Jim Hall, and then the fifth tune. I mean, the, the irony is actually none of them are really like Matheny you know um mm -hmm. which, which maybe uh 
that was like a conscious thing. Yeah, it was just too cl too close to home or something. <laughs> well, I, I had a funny experience with him around that time, which I thought was a great experience for me. Um, Do share. Uh, so so basically, I was you know playing be be da be da do di da do di do di da do. You know, have you heard? Uh -huh. Yeah. With the, the University of Miami big band, which I was playing in at the time, and we were doing for a pretty big crowd, and I practiced all my Matheny shit, you know, I'd really, I'd gone into that mode with Matheny, you know, and I was really shedding it, you know, and I was just ready to unleash my Matheny-isms on the world, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then I look as it's leading up to the solo, da, 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 mm -hmm. it's about to go into the solo, <laughs> and I look in the front row, and there's Pat Matheny. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So, for me, it was like a little synapse, like, whoa, okay. So you can't really sound just like somebody in front of them, you know? <laughs> like, it's almost like doing an impression of someone in their face, you know what I mean? It's like it's weird, you know? So I think I went home and I took all my Matheny records and I just put them away, you know? Mm, aside. Yeah. Yeah, for maybe like 10 years. You know? I had, it's funny, I had an experience when I was, uh, uh, there was a guitar player I was really idolizing when I was in school and he was my teacher and I just worked my ass off on sounding like him and he told me something that just blew me away in that way and he said that that the experience for him is like thinking that you're giving like a tour an organized tour like you're a tour guide and you're like check out this rock check out this country and you look back at the person you're leading and he's just imitating your steps <laughs> instead of like you know right oh wow seeing, seeing the things your, your teacher told you that That's yeah yeah that's that was that's a good teacher and, and and he you know even at the time like I mean I've said that to certain students and and they can take it either way sometimes they, they take it in a positive way sometimes they get really upset you know oh of course or well, if you I mean, tell them or if you tell them it's not even you sometimes it's someone else and you say hey man you gotta put this guy's record play sometimes it's like almost like telling a heroin addict that they can't shoot up that day you know what I mean well psychologically you're in a you're in a pretty a tough place because they yeah. come to study with you because they love what you do and yeah, obviously true. you're the like you are embodying something that they right. want and it's really it's really hard to like be like okay like study music from me study right. something general about the attitude but don't take any of the things that make me sound like me right because right. you'll just where, be where, where did you go to school i went to berkeley when i was like oh, cool. uh it was like 2003 so you probably uh, don't tell me who the teacher was there it was David Tronzo. He was a oh, Tronzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like a slide player, an avant-garde kind. Were, of were you playing dude. slide at the time? I, well, I stopped right after that. <laughs> How cool! How cool! That's but, uh, that's really a, like a a kind of unpredictable. That's not what I would have expected you to say. That's kind of cool. Well, it was uh, you know he had a whole thing with prepared guitar, and I really took that, started looping, making all these textures, yeah. and I thought my career would go this, like, you know, oh, my career, I, I was just a kid, but like, you know, I yeah. thought that that was my future, and then he was just like, you know, like, in in a sentence, just ended that whole right. thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, it's weird. I mean, we were, when we started touring with my band, we were the opening band for Alan Holdsworth's band on the last U.S. tour. We did 30 nights with them in the same van. And wow. I, was, that, was that a Leonardo tour? It was a Leonardo nice. tour, yeah. And, um, and, you know, Alan was just, I remember, like, you know, he was, we were listening to some guy who was an imitator of him. Like, I was, I was showing him, like, you know, right, on, sure. online, like, this guy who just yeah. really sounded like him. And he was... He was just freaking. He hated that shit so of much. Course, it was of course, of course. hilarious. He was, the, the people from that generation, especially, it's it's really like it, it's really like a like a very important factor. Like that you had, you found, you tried to find something to say. You know, mm -hmm. and, you know. I'm sure that, and there's some players, and you know, with Al, with someone like Alan or Pat Metheny, you know, it's. It's tough because, you know, you can kind of go there and you can kind of approximate it, you know, because there's a lot of mannerisms. I mean, mm -hmm. especially with someone like, actually with Holder, the only thing, you're never going to sound like them because, you know, that's them. And what they do is also just ridiculously difficult. But to approximate the sound is kind of not that hard, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so you can see why it happens. But, yeah, there's been some great players. I won't name any names, but there's been great players that heard 
Holdsworth and just changed their entire careers. You know, they like they, they tried to capture that. They tried to chase that sound, you know, and of course, yeah, I mean, I think with Coltrane, it, it really like, you know, as amazing as he was. I can't even imagine how many musical lives he ruined with like shitty imitators. I mean, there's there's really very little. Yeah. I can't even I can't think about anybody who did more damage to more but, people yeah, than but, him. Yeah, but that's all the way I always say it is this. So here's the thing. And that's kind of what I think about myself in a way, if I can pat myself a little on the back, is that I did it with enough different people. And I realized that I, that that had to be done, you know, mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, there's other people that just it, it transcend it based on the power of their creativity. I mean, if you hear Wayne Shorter's first records, he really mm -hmm. sounds a lot like Coltrane, you know? Yeah, so, definitely. So, you know, you can kind of hear, and he even studied with him, I think. So, you know, and I never heard him counteract that with, like, any other one player. Like, for instance, Mark Turner, that's what he did. He, he studied Coltrane, but then he also studied Warren Marsh, which are really different. So he mm -hmm. put them together... And that kind of sounds like Mark Turner. Mark Turner, right. You know, so, you know, he did that. I did that with, with probably five or six different guitar players, you know. But uh, by the time by the time Trioing came out, it sounded pretty integrated. And it's like, you know. Well, actually, it's, it's, you know, what's funny is there's a lot of people that knew me and my stuff before, you know. Um, and they, for them, Trioing was like a little bit of a, like, a, you know, like a freak out. Because, you know, here they are, they, they are imagine thinking of me as one thing, you know, as, as this kind of fu fusion chameleon or something, you know, uh -huh. but meanwhile, all along, I've been studying bebop and, 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 tr and trying to form a, a jazz concept as well. And, you know, um, so I think, I, I mean, I, I, I like trioing, but I think that's also uh, was a step in the process for me. I think what I'm doing now is a lot more complete, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, I wonder if wonder if you can even hear. Let me see. Hold on, may I can. Yeah, play, play. See if it, I have an MP3 of that. Let me see. This is like the the album before trioing. Yeah, considerably before trioing. <laughs> you know, like probably five six years because I moved to New York in that time and I just started. I I, I dropped my huge pedal board and all this stuff that I had and and I started to. To, to really, uh, you know, focus on jazz history mm -hmm. and language, and, you know. Um. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I was 19 or so. going for it. Jonathan. A lot of bending too. That's unbelievable. So this would have been like ninety eight, ninety seven, what? Ninety six. 96. I actually recorded maybe, maybe even 95 recorded. 
That's so. But that's, that's so funny. <laughs> that's that's not that's not even the most like holds worth out on the record. It's probably it, it it goes deeper. Well, there's live stuff on that record. That record has two live tunes. <laughs> Those tunes are really. It's funny because it's like you know, like note wise and like this, it's, it does sound like an articulation too. But like you know, the, the rhythm is like kind of, there's something that's like still deeply you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of lines in there that I hear, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm still playing some of that. <laughs> well, the physical stuff, some of it you can't shake. Check out this one. This one's. Yeah, this yeah. I always like this tune. I always thought maybe I should bring it back and play it. We're bringing it now. All these people have no fucking clue. Let's see. Let's see. Hold on. This is a live one. Is the sound clear enough? It's just coming through my speakers. It's going to be okay. Check this out. Very old breath. This is a trio. The drummer's playing the chords with a drum cat. <laughs> You're like, use them. Cycle. That. Dude, how psychologically? How does how did you put that that how did you put that guy to bed? Uh, <laughs> like you mean, when you hear it now, don't you wonder like what that like Jonathan that like is like going out like smashing rock clubs would have been? Oh, well, I mean, you know, the, the truth is, I mean. That's what I'm saying. Like, so when I moved to New York, I think in a way I had to kind of, you know, I think I, I you know, I, I did quite a bit of that. People just don't know about it. But I mean, I was playing bebop in Miami, but I was also doing this. I had this group. I had a group of the singer that was the same rhythm section called Third Wish. And uh, we opened for Via. We opened for Malmsteen. You know, we did that, those kind of gigs a little bit. So I had a taste of that, you know. Mm. I really liked it, but there were some things I didn't like. Um, what, what didn't what, you like? Well, like what I didn't like is that basically, well, two things probably. One thing was the volume. Like I didn't like playing that loud all the time. I really realized that one of the things I loved about jazz was those overtones that happen when you're playing at a certain volume, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of jazz guys think I play loud, but I mean, they have no idea what loud is. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you play in a rock band or a fusion band, you know what it sounds like when you've got the amps up and the, the drummer's hitting the cymbals at the fucking as hard as he can, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember seeing Holdsworth with Gary Husband and those guys and 
It was great, man, but it was loud, you know? They're smashing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're smashing uh, it. It's a certain thing, you know? And it has a certain feeling. I mean, Gary Husband can actually play however he wants, but that was mm-hmm. the situation, you know? Because um, he can play acoustic jazz, too. But, you know, I think Alan was leaning more towards that way, so that's what the band did, you know? Um, but, yeah, so, you know, which ironically, you know, I can't say anything bad about Holdsworth because for me, he's one of my fathers, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, but I would say that one thing that was for me was always a reckoning, uh, something I couldn't reconcile. That's the word I'm going to couldn't reconcile was this beauty that he had on his records and these dynamics that he had on his albums. But that live, he, he didn't really touch on that that much. You know, it was no. like live, it was, it was much louder, much denser. Um, much less of the beautiful harmony, you know, going on, um, especially when he played in trio because he, that's his style. He would play the head with these chords and then he'd blow with his single lines and it didn't really mingle. And that was actually, there you go. That's another big thing that I, I think, I think we, but we missed the, we missed the era cause he was like personally just like, I mean, I, I was like in, interested with being his caretaker for like three and a half weeks. It right. was a shit show. Oh, it yeah, was, it yeah, was I just know, I know. tough. Yeah. So it's like, you yeah, know. I mean, I would, I don't want to talk about any of that too much. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but, but I know, you know, I know, you know, his, his, he had demons, man. Alan. Yeah, yeah. But it's <laughs> like, you know, I'm saying that, you know, I think. Yeah. Before he, before he even passed, you know, there was a couple of years before that when I started, I feel like I felt it in my soul that something was coming, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I actually reached out to Steve Hunt and Gary and, you know, start started to talk about maybe getting together with Alan, you know, and going out there. And from talking, the more I realized it was like you, it probably wasn't going to happen, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of it because of those kind of things that you know it could just pull you in, you know, because you know he had a really specific personality, and it's mm-hmm. linked it's linked to his genius, I'm sure. You know, unfortunately, it's one of those, you know. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, I suspect that maybe somewhere in the 80s or 70s, like, you know, the shows were more together. Uh, like, Well, no, don't get me wrong. No, no, I, in, I think in, maybe maybe you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. So because what the thing I'm talking about, pretty much I never saw in the shows. So but so, I mean, I love the shows. I mean, you have to understand, I went in the uh, in the 90s around this time probably maybe even a little earlier i would go he would play at the musicians exchange friday two mm-hmm. shows saturday two shows i would go and just live there basically <laughs> every set. I, I would go to every set every every night and no that that was amazing man it was amazing mm-hmm. um so yeah don't get me wrong it was amazing but but it was a certain aspect of him you know what i mean mm-hmm. like in other words what i mean is like you know distance versus desire on sand this is the mm-hmm. thing he does where it's like a duo with himself. He's got syntax. Right. And, cards, the, and, and he, the lines. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff. That stuff never happened live. It never mm-hmm. happened live. Mainly for, for a couple reasons. I think for one, Alan was a wreck when he played. He got really emotional and really, uh, he had to drink to, to get through the gigs, basically, you know? Sure. He so was very I, nervous, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think to play that music, you have to be really calm and at peace, you know. And that's something that I, I just I realized that a long time ago, and I work on that. You know, it's it's a really hard thing for me too to to find that thing, you know. Um. And and some players have that that ability to just really be calm in the music. Like Keith can do that. Keith Jarrett, you know, or Nelson Veras, who I play with, can do that. Mm-hmm. They're really masters at that. No matter what's going on, even if they feel unsure about their playing or life or what's happening at that moment they can just go into their world and and make something very tender and beautiful you know mm. for you there are th- there are things external things that make you just uneasy at sometimes oh like me- what, what makes you lose your peace oh yeah, yeah. i mean uh, probably the same things as everybody you know just you know stress when i'm putting my own tours together a lot of times being out there all the all that stuff is it, it's a challenge to really at that moment say okay forget everything. Let me be in that moment. And, you know, Mm -hmm. when I was young, I could just do it naturally, but, uh, you know, uh, well, you were handling less juggling, less, uh, things. Yeah. I didn't care about that, you know, but, but, but anyways, what I was going to say is I think that's one of the reasons for Holdsworth. And I think the other one is the thing that I, that I also was, uh, wary about, about that 
that world. Remember I told you I was playing with fusion bands and, and, and I had this kind of progressive rock group. And what I saw was that those audiences are different than jazz audiences. They come to see blood, you know? Oh, yes. So it's like it, it, that creates a certain thing. And I think that, that that's one of the, the paradoxes of Alan is that Alan enjoyed that and he liked that side. But he mm -hmm. also had like a really sweet, sensitive musical side that was really more of a jazz musician's personality. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I think that those two things never came together in a healthy way for him, you know? I think when he would play, he would show up, people would just, oh, they were ready, you know what I mean? And, and he would just be a little uptight and nervous and, and he would just give it to him because he could do it. He could play, you know, stuff that would just blow your head off, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that, it was, that, that was the point of the show. There yeah, it was, and it was amazing, amazing lines, you know, an amazing interaction between him and especially when Gary Gary with, husband, yeah. You know, those guys has just had this interaction thing that was really on another level. Um, but but for whatever reason, whether it was that situation or his mood, it couldn't it never got to that thing that I loved about distance first desire or uh home. Yeah. You know, you know, these the way he would play ballads and the way he would play harmony and the way he would play over harmony was somehow quite not quite uh, and the dynamics on the record, there was more dynamics, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's it's not a complaint. It's just saying that, you know, that's maybe one reason why I love his shows for one thing and I love his albums for something else. And I kind of mm -hmm. sometimes wish that the shows could have had a little more of that. Well that side you know you you brought up something interesting that i want to go a little bit deeper into which is like you're right that the fusion audiences want blood but what what do you in your mind what do jazz audiences want like what's the mind frame of going to your show yeah well ideally well i mean i guess part of it is yeah yeah uh, 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 for me and this is what i said about the everything and, and I can't even, even muttering my name in the same sentence as Alan Holdsworth, for me, just so you know, between you and I, is like sacrilege. I, I, you, know, <laughs> you know, in my mind, I'm still that little kid studying all these guitar players. And trying to things. So, you know, if, some, if people love my music, it's great, man. But, you know, I just don't want it to ever sound like I'm putting myself in the same sentence, you know. I think you've made that very clear right now that you're not. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah, no, so I mean... Um, what I what I would like to think is that my shows have a very complete story. You know, I want I want people to experience that same thing that that I that I loved on certain records, whether it was him or Coltrane or you know uh, Matheny, where it has like a kind of a shape where you have you know dynamics and the most different types of emotions happening. You know, um, that's something that you know. Not only do I like doing it, but I feel like I have to do it because I, I could never blow people's heads off the way Holdsworth could anyways, you know. I mean, maybe if I had kept going in that direction, I could have done it a little more. But mm -hmm. at some point, I guess I just realized, even though I love it, it wasn't my my complete calling, you know. Sure. I, I loved playing ballads, man. I did a record of all ballads, you know. I love I love harmony and and, and the other thing is is – you know, the integration of harmony and melody, the way I do it when I play in a trio, you know, or something like that is something that I, I really always wanted to be able to do, yeah. you know. Specifically and, with you, the way that you play counterpoint lines, I think that was, uh, I really can't think of another guitar player that does it any better. So that, thanks, that, thanks. that yeah, that, that was, that's like for well, me something that always stands out. Yeah, yeah, and now it's becoming more of a thing, but when I first started doing it, it was really not that common, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of the young guys now, you know, there's just a whole army of young guitar jazz guys that are now, now the information is so available that there's really great ones coming out a lot, like every second now. Um, yeah, but then none of them have the, seems very few of them have the playing experience to make it crystallize. That, that's that. kind of like the demon of, of our day. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's 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 a... Uh, there was a, a, a Vinnie Caliuta quote that was that was pretty awesome because I I had thought about it but it hadn't really hit me yet and someone asked him what do you think about 
players these days. And he said, man, there's some great, he was about drummers, but it, it could really be applied to everything. He said, there's some great drummers, man, very amazing players. They can play great. He said, but if you push me, what I'll say is, is that there's so much information available for them now that they can, everyone can just get this information anywhere. And, and it says, okay, you hit this, this way, you hit this, this way. And that sounds good. This, this is how to play. And people can just figure it out like that literally exactly as they see it you know slow it down on youtube you know mm -hmm. you know and he said but but the the result is going to be different than when i was a kid because when i was a kid we had to figure out how to do something we heard in the moment and usually we would approximate the feeling of the music and find a way to achieve it and he said, so the result is now what you have is a very heightened level of mediocrity. And it, yeah. was, and it was that quote when he said that, I was like, oh, man. He, yeah, he, he, he got it. him. He yeah, got him. Yeah. And he didn't, I don't think he meant it in any kind of a, of a mean way. Oh, no, it, it hurts more when it's just honesty. Yeah, he just <laughs> meant it in a way like, you know, this is what people are doing. So We, we call it pajamming. What, There's pajamming? A lot of, pajamming. There's a lot of pajamas. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it's what happens if you're just. A, yeah. I mean, well, I don't even, know. I mean, it's even ones. I mean, it's not even. I mean, I would say it's even out the guys out there doing gigs. There's guys doing that because it's just you know, they just. It's just not as individualistic as it was. You know, I mean, if you think about that time for guitar, man, it's such a heavy time. Mm -hmm. The late seventies, guitar particularly, were just well piano too, but. But I mean, when you uh, could imagine that you had Holdsworth playing with like, I guess that was what he was doing at that time, maybe Soft Machine or Tony Williams. Yep. Uh, you had George Benson coming out with kind of some of the most ridiculous jazz yeah. guitar playing. You Ever. Know. Right. Um, and then you had, you know, a very young Pat Metheny just starting to find his, his way. Right. And, like, Schofield and Mike Stern with Miles. I mean, and what a time for, for guitar. It really was like a... You know, I mean, we live in a pretty good time now too, but it's it's different. You know, that's well, that's, that's to a, me actually. I think the time you came out is probably the most traumatizing time to make music ever. Because when I when we started playing, like touring was really like 2011, and there was not even the hope of a record label or any sort of help. So we were like those like lizards running around the deserts, just like drinking a cactus, just you know, <laughs> figuring yeah, it out. But you want to know the irony for me is mm. that was the best time for me. Why? Because, okay, so I've, I've, even though you could hear, you know, I was pretty playing great at, at, at that mm -hmm. age and doing a lot. I never, I didn't understand much of the business and I just went ahead and I wanted to play all the time. So I never became a, like, I was never a golden child. Like mm -hmm. I, I call there's certain guitar players especially, that I kind of consider golden the golden child of a certain, every five years you have one, you know? And they're like <laughs> this guy who goes out and he does all the competitions and he wins the competitions and, yeah. and he gets, you know, you know, gets pays some money to a booking agent and does everything by the system, you know? Yeah. Um, so I never had that. I never yeah. had that. That's I a would, good thing. You can, it's, you can hear it. <laughs> well, that's cool. Thanks, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. I always just played the way I wanted to play and, and sometimes, like you can see, just turned on a dime and tried different shit, you know, so, yeah. but, you know, the, I never courted any of those systems, you know, like the, the straight ahead jazz guys or even the fusion guys, because, you know, to, it's, some may say that if they heard me at that time, I was like one of, I could have been one of the golden childs of fusion, you know? Yeah. But then I moved to New York and started playing a 175 through a through a deluxe with no pedals, you know. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I, maybe I'm a little, you know, career suicide. Uh, you know, I could kind of do every once in a while. But you know, but but what did happen was I, I worked with a couple of small labels in the two, early 2000s. You were on Crisscross, right? Crisscross and Mel Bay. Mel Bay had a label, and mm -hmm. I did my original stuff with Mel Bay, basically, and more like jazz stuff. Standards, with, right? Yeah. And then I learned, wow, okay, I did some number crunching. And I said, well, if I do, if I start my own label, which I did for trioing, actually, I had started the label, but it wasn't with any economical hopes at that point. 
And that's how, you know, the guy from Criss Cross heard that and signed me. That's how I got to that. So it was, you know, I had a history of putting out records myself, but it was at some point, probably around when you just said, when you, th when you're thinking it was, was when I started my label and I put out shadowless. Um, and actually I made more money than I've ever made before or after. Mm. Because what happened was this was the time, you know, he sold probably 5,000, 6,000 copies of that record or something like that, which for jazz is actually a lot, you know, mm -hmm. um, because people still used CDs. Streaming hadn't begun. Um, you could use, you know, I, you could sell your stuff through iTunes, your MP3s. Mm -hmm. MP3s were just starting to get more, more and more takeover. Um, for me, it was, it was an it was all yours. absolute yeah. golden age. Yeah, from mm. from about you know 2010 to about 2015, you know the yeah, those, it's, it's those not like you would get. Yeah, so for me, if that would have gone on forever, I would have been having a very healthy career, you know. Um, yeah, and and what ha what happened between? I noticed that like you know I looked at your discography and you were kind of on a rhythm of putting a record every two years, pretty yeah. consistently, and then there was like this lag between 2014 and 2018. Between yeah. the one with Nelson Barris. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. You just. Yeah. So uh, maybe it was even earlier. Maybe it was like two. Th maybe I would call the golden age like 2008 to uh, to 2014. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. like you know something like that. Um, yeah. Well, that's exactly what happened. To be honest, Spotify happened. Um, yeah. And you're not uh, into that. <laughs> Uh, not at all, man. It's yeah. it, for me. It's been a killer. It's been a killer, and I know exactly what it is. I mean, I try not to rant about it too much. I did a oh, little. Oh, please, dude. This is the place. Yeah, no, but I mean, at this point, you know, it's 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 a little sad. It's just it's just it was a tidal wave that that you know the next generation didn't see the folly in it, and or maybe they maybe they maybe they did, and maybe they just realized before I did that it was a tidal wave, anyways. But you know what what I see it as is basically. What Spotify was, was those labels that were getting screwed during my golden age that were saying, you know, hey, OK, there's now there's guys like this guy who are putting out their own records. And, and you know, on, a, on the rock bands that did it were selling way more than me. You know? Oh, yeah. You know, um, and, and that started even earlier in the rock world. You know what I mean? Um, but basically, yeah, they, they you know. They started to lose control because, mm -hmm. you know, earlier they had it, you know, um, you know, that's why I put out my own record. The first one, the, the fusion kind of one or whatever. Um, yeah, although, they burned the whole thing down. They burned yeah, They burned the system down. Yeah. So so that uh, exactly. So that so that's what it was to me. One day it was it was a bunch of these fat old guys with cigars and Scott <laughs> sitting around and they said those little fuckers, those musicians. Yeah. Man, they're starting that, <laughs> and we're making less money, you know. Yeah. And then one of the guy who had like too many scotches was like, "I got an idea." He's, <laughs> he's like, "Let's make music sales worthless." Yeah. And the other guys are like, "Ah, shut up, shut up." And he's like, "Hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, <laughs> this is how it's gonna work." He's like, "If we can get this digital thing going, no one has to buy music, so the whole public will start to think." Hey, I'm getting music for free. And as a result, for every second of music heard anywhere in the world by anybody, they'll get half of it, the musicians, which will be nothing. But we are going to get half of everything, which in a huge siphon is going to be billions of dollars. Right. And then a couple of guys sobered up and they were like, hold on a second. Let's go. <laughs> and they started crunching numbers and they said, you know what? This just might work. Yeah, and, and it did. Those guys are billionaires. Well, let, let that be a lesson to you. You you pee on big business, they get wet. Big business pees on you, you drown. That's right. There you go. There you go. That should be the Spotify, like, you know, slogan. <laughs> you know, so, so and, and the, the drag for me was when I saw my former students and young musicians coming up, and they were just so desperate to get gigs and get their shit out there that they just immediately went and gave their shit up to the streaming mm. scenes. And I saw that happen and I said, oh, man, this is it, you know. And then I literally saw that happen where some of those guys were starting to get more gigs and I wasn't. And like, you know, I said, what's going on? And then I went look and see, oh, look at them. They're on Spotify. They got 50,000 followers on Spotify. You know what I mean? And I, yeah. that's when it hit me. And I said, 
they had it's done. It's totally it, done. You know? Well, that that world is done. Um, yeah. Now now we're in the world of, uh, but in a way, we're we're back into something that's a lot more like where it started, which is just you know, travel minstrel life and well, get the money yeah. at the door. Yeah, and don't make any money. Well, I mean, there which is, is money, back, but it's which but, is back <laughs> where it started too. <laughs> Because if you go back, you know, if you go back to some of the legends of jazz and blues, man, those guys were freaking starving, man. They were really not making money, and and there were people, yeah. making money, management yeah. and record labels that were making a lot of money off them. So, you know, back to the brothels. Yeah, that's so, <laughs> so that's where it's going. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's but that's it's actually kind of true, man. I mean, you know, even for me now, touring is, is very difficult with a quartet. You know, my new band is really a quartet, and. Man, it's what, so, how so? Why is it difficult? I mean, financially, to, to oh. you know, to to pay for flights and 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 bring four guys on the road is not easy, you know. Did you guys ever do the van thing? Uh, I did the van thing, yeah. And my tree, my old that that trio, we we used to tour up and down the East Coast, you know. That you know that lasted for two years before I moved to New York. We did that, and every time we drove to New York, I would see, I'd say, uh. I think I have to go here, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, well, yeah. I, I guess this this is after after all this uh, after all but, these oh, moments oh, of pure optimism. Oh, go ahead. But that that being said, I'll just say, but the van tour concept for jazz is very tough, mainly so. uh, because America is getting dumber. Yeah. So I we, have not had that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we t- we tour a lot in Europe and Japan. Um, we have great cities in America where they really have strong jazz infrastructure, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, you're you're playing more fusion music. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know. Remember, you said the difference between jazz and fusion audiences. You know, you know, I I, I don't say you you hear me. You know, I, I've played you where I come from and and some of the things I've done. You know, I don't mean it as a, an insult. But, of jazz, course. but jazz musicians are less musically edu- I mean, jazz, fusion musicians are less musically uh, educated. You know, they, they, they love music, but they're not necessarily like guys that, that could tell you who Coltrane is and really, you know, studied, studied the, uh, the tradition or, or, you know, you know, that's why when you go, when you play or Holdsworth plays, there's like 5% of the people, they really know music. They really are great musicians and they studied and the rest of them are they're there to see blood. It's a different, you know. Did you ever think that maybe your life is like the plot of like a Spartacus or Gladiator kind of movie where you try to do one thing and you come from this thing and the system wears you down and now it's like time to get like Chad Weckerman and like Jimmy Johnson and well, it's like you want blood? <laughs> I'll give you fucking blood. It's like wah. <laughs> Hey man, and don't go, go would, out there with like a quadruple, like <laughs> get in the van. That would be fun, you, man. Don't be wrong. Dude, I want to, I want to make the the soundtrack to your fucking movie. Christ, <laughs> man, are you kidding? Christ, like out for blood, 2020. That, that's that's it's just like, it's like you traveling the American countryside during the second Trump presidency. Playing for the bloodthirsty like people in Oklahoma, just shredding. <laughs> man, Dude, we we fuck fuck Spotify. We can make a Netflix special. Man, don't get me wrong, that would be fun, you know. Dude, that would be the shit. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you know, you know as well as I do that 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 would be, you know, I don't I don't take it lightly to to play that music. I would, you know, if I really wanted to get back to real fusion playing, do it. No, but I, I, would need, I would need, uh, you know, a couple of years, you know, to really uh, come up with a concept again. And that I have great respect for great fusion music, you know. I I know, but, but it's like you know, but in the, in the other side of that coin, now you're just over intellectualizing it. But um, but this is you need to tap into your young Bob Dylan, go well, read the fucking newspaper and shred. Jonathan, you need to shred. <laughs> You've been in New York too long. You've been waiting for this point of the interview. For the <laughs> no, I haven't. It just so, occurred to me. It's like it's so you. Uh, <laughs> you've been you've been driving me here. 
No, but the tr- I mean, the truth is with, with the quartet, you know, we, we do have elements of that where it goes mm-hmm. full on. I mean, that, uh, that's one reason that I chose the guys that are in my band right now, actually, because the band now really has moments of where it, it, it goes there, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And that's hard to find. I love the quartet. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm into it. Yeah, and there's and there's new quartet stuff that you haven't heard yet. It's, it's, the new quartet is really a, another thing. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, but yeah, so that's more what I'm always trying to do is try and find a way to kind of balance them, you know, to, mm-hmm. to, to bring that into, into that world, which is challenging because I'm trying to do it in a certain way, you know. Um, but, you know, that being said, you know, I don't want to sound so dark about America and make it sound like, oh, America is just a bunch of dumb people. You know, that's, that's definitely not what I'm trying to say. I mean, I'll just say that, like, in Europe, you have you have central c- cities mm-hmm. where you have very strong concentrations of many different people. So your audience could be, you know, people that aren't necessarily musicians, because I don't really want an all musician audience either, but, but just people that grew up and knew how to play an instrument, some piano, some guitar, or maybe they listened to a lot of good music and they have a certain respect and love for music that has a lot of different storylines besides just face melting. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, America, we have some great cities where there's great audiences, you know, um, I can say some of them are New York, of course. Um, we have, uh, also Denver has a great audience for music. Um, LA, uh, but you know they're they're so far apart from each other. Yeah. You know what I mean. Um, so and, and then America also has this traditionalist jazz scene, which I don't fit into either. So there's yeah. certain clubs that just will never probably have me because well, those places are turning into like date night spots. They're not listening rooms anymore. You know, it's like yeah, they, yeah, they really some, went to some of them. Although I, you know, I'll say like I've played somewhere like if they're primed in the right way. You know, if I play there with Lonnie. You can see that they're that they that they're ready for great music, but it's mm-hmm. they're kind of conditioned to, to think that it has to be a certain thing and has a certain type of person playing it even sometimes without going into that subject, you know. But you know, it's 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 tough. America has issues, basically. So the idea of getting in a van and going around in America it can be tricky. I mean, not to mention some of like sometimes you get two great cities that look pretty close on the map, and then you really- <laughs> they're very far. This is America, man. That's seven hours, you know, like seven sure. hours drive before a gig is not something that I want to do. I, I tend sure. to cut the, the drives. I try to tend to cut travel time at like four hours. If it's more uh, than four hours to me, I, I, you know, when you were out with Holdsworth, did you guys do like more than a four hour drive and then a gig? Uh, yeah, some days. I mean, I've, I've in Marvin, we've been uh, like at about 250 dates a year and just That's driving. Awesome everywhere like you know so we we we've done 10 12 hour drives and then a gig so oh fuck. yeah 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 it's it's but again I, we we didn't grow up with your like you know I, like i told you we're we're those les- like like lizards running around the desert drinking the cactus that's right. that's how we grew up we didn't so you'll, so you'll get up at 7 a.m and start driving and get there oh, sometimes sometimes we do a master class at a university so we'll drop we'll drive all day play the gig drive all night get in the morning to the university do the master class go to sleep wake up like you know at the city and do the thing on repeat we'd sleep like one night every two, like one day every two days oh like shit just, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah and we did that for years it was like psychotic uh, well yeah i did that with the first trio things like that i mean not quite like that but pretty pretty serious but that was you know i was 20 you know yeah mm-hmm. 19 even uh, yeah, now, no, I, I got a bad back. I wouldn't do it. Wouldn't, you, know? <laughs> you don't have to. I'm not going to make you. Huh. Here, here's a question for you. Like, let's say I was born right when trio, trioing came out. And, and I'm right now finishing school and I want to move to New York. Right. Wow. Yeah. Which is like, which is, I, I know you can't even imagine that in yeah, the timeline. To think about that. that yeah. You're yeah. Right. There is kids that are just getting ready to pick a college. Yeah. Stuff Pick a, well, I mean, let's say I'm out of college and I'm I want to be a guitarist in New York. Any brotherly advice to these people? Because you're painting a pretty dark picture, and um, well, you don't mean to be, but I you are. So. I'm just <laughs> I'm just realistic at this point. Um, sure, but like, let's say your little brother was like right about to move to your neighborhood, 
and uh, wanting yeah. to, to follow in your career path? What, what should you do? I mean, yeah, okay. So the, the one thing I will say is, you know, for whatever I'm making it sound like, when it comes to playing, you know, I'm happy playing music, you know, oh, and that's, yeah. that's another thing, playing, playing jazz you know, I, I can go like a gig I did last night. I do a couple of originals, but I do a lot of standard and stuff. I can play that for five people and I can be happy, you know, <laughs> playing this kind of like the other stuff I played you like fusion, which is clearly reaching out. You know, it's like reach one is some of the jazz you play it and it's a little more introspective. But when you're reaching out and there's like 10 people in the audience, it feels silly. It doesn't feel right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know. Yeah. There's something about the inner quest of jazz that I, that I was attracted to as well, because I realized I, I realized that all that fame and money and shit doesn't actually mean anything to me. It's not it's yeah. not much important to me. I mean, also growing up in Miami, I had opportunities to go and play with some big bands like, you know, pretty cheesy pop music and stuff like that. But I could have gone on the road and made money and done that. And I just I didn't like the taste of it. So well, with the jazz thing, you can you can speak to yourself, but you can only scream at an audience. <laughs> Screaming at yourself is unacceptable. I think I might have to pause and just let the postman in. Hold sure, on. sure. No worries. Thank you. 
So, Howdy. <laughs> will you be able to edit that down or something? No, but it'll be all right. People oh. love it. People love you with all their hearts. Ah, oh, man. Well, they got to hear well, some nice guitar. Yeah, well, we're going to call it the, the second act. But, but seriously, like, let's say I'm moving to New York. What should I do? What, what's, the, what's the proper well, way to be as a human being to gear yourself to some sort of thing approximating success in this thing? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I guess the one thing I, I always just say to the, the young, the really young students, because I do get some asking me questions like that are just short of like, should I do this? You know, um, I never asked that question. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know why. Maybe there was a moment of doubt in the first few years when I moved to New York because it was kind of like, that's a big change, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and like realizing like there was certain things in life maybe I wouldn't possess, you know, as a sacrifice to what I was doing. Um, but for me, it was answered pretty quickly, you know? Um, by the connections formed. Trying not by to drink too much at that period, you know, because I realized that, you know, free booze every night. It's something to, to watch out for, you know. Yeah, big um, time. You know, and you, and you need to live a life, but it's hard when you, especially when you move to New York, not to get distracted, you know, you know mm -hmm. by how much input there is life-wise, you know. Um, so for me, you know, I went through, a, I would say, yeah, maybe a little dark, you know, uh, but fun sometimes period of tumultuous period you know mm -hmm. uh, and you know I just found my way and and almost like through that defined as an adult that's what I mean remember the thing I was talking about about when I was young just mm -hmm. part of it is that is that you just you don't you're not thinking about life you're just thinking about music and that's a beautiful thing but there's another beautiful thing that can happen later when you define what your life means you know and, well, and, and, and Taoism, the, the whole idea is a balance between chaos and order. And when you're just in music, you're purely in chaos and you get the, all the treasure is there and you get to yank things back into the real world. And you're just what you're describing is like this shift towards order. Right. Yeah, I guess so. Although, I mean, I don't know. I mean, chaos for me, I don't really think of chaos when I think of music. I mean, I, I think of that. That's only one one element, you know. I think that there's a lot of order in my music, actually, as well. Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying, oh, of course, yeah. there should be. But that's that's what practice is, drawing things from the realm of just unorganized sound into your system. Oh, yeah, sure. you're, you're yeah. growing a system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Built, and building something, you know. And I, yes. I, I was always kind of attracted to that, you know, this idea of that actually unlike the worldly um, zone in music, you actually can build something and, you know, a hurricane may not knock it down. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's like it's actually you can, you know, there's some things that are actually more. It really comes across in your playing, too. Like when I listen to your solos, there are kind of you're into a thing for a while and then on to the next thing. And it's very like, yeah, say, like, yeah, yeah the, your, yeah. the structure is very apparent. Yeah, that's 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 something I've always liked, you know. Um, and then I, I like to have elements of the chaos as well. You know, if you have mm -hmm. both, you know, it can really. uh it can really kind of become a thing. Um, but, you know, that being said, yeah, life is like that. And uh, I mean, uh, I guess for me, I came out of that realizing that my existence was going to be different maybe than the average Joe's and that mm -hmm. I just had to find a way to make sense of that and to keep keep making music that I liked, you know. And I kind of succumbed to making music that I thought – was going to fit in a certain scene or that was going to make me more money or was going to do all those things never sometimes consciously and sometimes subconsciously I just never went there you know I mean I'll say that even in you know when if you think of of, a, of something like New York jazz as being so individualistic even since I moved here I can see there's all these little clicks and scenes and man I never was into that even when I was in high school I didn't give a shit about that so why would I be like that now so when I see that in musicians it bugs me a little bit and that's here <laughs> It's everywhere. It's in L.A. It's, you know, but I've never been like that. I've always been that when I was in school, I was that kid who like just 
put my head down and went and did my thing, and I just was into what I wanted to do, you know. So well, it's very apparent that you have a, you know, that you probably all your life had a pretty strict amount of time dedicated to practicing and studying. Yeah, I still and, have that. I still have that. It's harder now because I'm managing my own thing and out on the road all the time, and you know. But I, I, I kind of make those things happen. But yeah, finding a way to balance that with with a life is is the real challenge. You know, as, mm -hmm. as we can see, and so, uh, like we talked about Alan and people like this, who is, man, it's, it's very hard sometimes to balance living in that world, that art, art, artistic head, you know, and then also balancing this, this thing we call life, you know, which is, it's a very yeah. difficult, very difficult thing. So I just, my only advice would be, you got to love the music, number one, like, and number two, you have to find your own path. That's the yeah. Two. There's no way around those two things, you know. Um, well, you know, there's always ways to make a career in music, you know. Sure. Which is, I have friends that went on to play with great pop stars and work on the Tonight Show and do all these kind of things, and you know, they found a career in music. You yeah. Know? I, 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 I just, I just had this encounter with uh, Andreas Soberg. I asked him to be on this thing, oh, and cool. he said, and he said, I'm retired for from guitar. I was just like, what? And, and he's and it's producing like, J-pop albums. K-pop. K-pop, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Korean pop. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's his path, you know? I, mean, I know. I'm, yeah. I, I double want to have him now. Yeah. I mean, there's like bitterness and resentment are the most, two of the most interesting emotions to talk about. And it's yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, no, no. He's, where, where's he from? He's from Sweden or Norway? Sweden, yeah. yeah they, they, don't, they don't do those. They don't do bitterness and resentment there. They just, I know. They just go just, produce pop records. Yeah, yeah, they go. They're Vikings. They're they're out to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you know it's, it's cool. Whatever you know, whatever whatever you know. That's the other thing is just yeah. Don't be. You got to find happiness. Whatever yeah. makes. Yeah. And it, in my way, I, I'm very happy. I'm like my, me and my wife were talking about this the other day about how sometimes when you have something that's so satisfying. Um, I don't even like to use the word happiness because happiness isn't a real thing. You know, happiness is, is very temporary, a very temporary little thing, you know, but satisfaction is something that, you know, that I can say, you know, you can say how, how often in your life are you satisfied? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that with music, I'm always in some way, well, satisfied is the wrong word too, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of those reaching artists. I'm never happy. You know, I'm never the word, the word you're looking for is eudaimonious. Exactly. I don't, yeah. I don't know it, but I believe you. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, it, I'm, I'm, I'm in a constant state of searching and this is pleasing to me in some sick way, maybe, mm -hmm. but it's okay. My point is that when you, when you're with someone like that, like for my wife, it's hard to, ne to necessarily understand that because, you know, someone a significant other or your friends and family around you, they, they don't, they don't experience necessarily that same thing. So, you know, we may be in our zone and doing this thing and, and the world is still going on around us and experiencing it in the way they experience it, you know? So coming to ba finding a way to balance that is really a, a, a difficult thing to do. And, you know, yeah. that's, that's been my quest the past 10, 10 years or so is yeah. trying to find well. Well, by the time you figure out music, then you throw relationships. It's like you're juggling, and then somebody like throws a bowling ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're really they're really not related in, in a in an obvious way, you know. No, no, but there's a way to make things work for a while. I mean, we all we all check out the same way, so. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's it, awesome. It, well, it actually blows my mind when I realize how old Alan was. Actually, we're back on Alan just for a second because yeah. Sometimes I still thought of him as really young, but I realized he was 78, 77 or something like that. It's like No, no, he was uh when he died, I think he was just 70. Right around 70. You sure? When we were touring together, he was 66 oh, so and he then, died. Okay, okay. So he was maybe 71? Could yeah. Have that, I guess that's that still area. that's still up there though. Mhm. Mm um Yeah. I, I'm trying to remember what year did Alan was he born? Let's see. My guess would my guess would be forty seven, forty six. Forty six. Yeah. So yeah. that would make seventy. Yeah. Yeah, but he was. I mean, I gotta say, like as a guy, 
he was just a fucking awesome guy to hang out with. Like oh, the, sure. we we had we we had to pick him up from the airport uh, in Philadelphia uh, when we started the tour, and Leonardo was like, just and we didn't know Alan. He's like, just don't let him drink. And we're like, okay. So we like, you know, we like pick him up at the terminal. He's like, so fellas, are we going to the bar? Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we're going to the bar. So like we go to the bar immediately, and it's like, you know, we're just hanging out. It's like 7 p.m. It's like tequila. But like, all right. Tequila? Oh, Jesus. Tequila? And it's like, we're like five in, and we're all just like, no, no tequila. And he's starting like buying shots for everybody like in the room, right? And then like, you know, our base so is like. This is like a day before you're starting a tour? Like. Yeah, the night before. And right. our, our bassist is just standing there. And then like, he's just looking at Alan because he's like a little nervous. And then Alan looks at him and he's like, I'm not gay. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry. It's like, Oh, all right. Anyways, and then uh, we had we well, he had a con. <laughs> did, he say, did he say that as a joke? No. Man, because because that's that's even funnier if it was a joke. Like I say, I mean, I, we didn't know. We didn't know. Actually, I, actually, I'm not sure which is funnier. It's either funnier <laughs> if it was a joke or funnier if it wasn't a joke. It's uh, funny for uh, like the first twelve minutes, you know, your hero. Regardless, so, you know. So basically, you mean your buddy was just like sitting there looking at him. Yeah, like admiring him. <laughs> and, and Alan said, "I'm I'm not gay. I'm not gay. That's it. Just, <laughs> yeah. just three words. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's kinda... Anyway, but yeah, we we got in we got him into a lot of trouble. But we um. I guess I guess he just wanted to establish that really quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good that he did. Uh, <laughs> we had a show in Toronto. And at the time we were, our drummer was basically a criminal and um, he like had a bag of weed and he threw it and he, he like threw it out right before the border, but he like smoked some and they smelled it on us. So we had like the dog searching the car with oh, him, geez. Jimmy Haslip and uh, Virgil. Well, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure he became a big hit with those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was not good. It was not good. But we had, we had a lot of good times together. A lot of bond, bonding moments. Uh looking for him at night and stuff <laughs> looking, looking for alan oh yeah he went in detroit he left both his guitars at a bar he forgot him uh we had to go look for his guitars like oh my god after a gig like those two steinberg we just fought like you know it's like we found him tucked in next to a bar stool like four blocks away from the venue <laughs> but, but, but yeah basically so he went there to grab probably a drink before the show and I then, think right think, after the show, oh, and then the and then got to the hotel without any guitars. Uh, yeah, dude, oh. it was it, it it shit got real real fast, but um, but again, you know, it's like from what Ga and Gary tells me, he he never really talks about music. Never. Yeah. Never. But but again, it's like it's all for show. He knows everything. Yeah. He yeah. knows. He knows everything, and know. it's like. Yeah. I, I, there's a funny, there's a famous, uh, well, famous amongst my friends because they, they saw like a, a recording of him at the Blue Note doing a workshop. And I asked him a question. Uh, and and it, it's, it's funny because he it basically uh, I called him on something because, uh, or I didn't call him, but, but like, uh, I can't remember what, I, I can't even actually remember what the question was, but it was something about reading music. And in, later in the same workshop, he's like, so I used to read through this Slonimsky book, you know, and, and he had already said he doesn't read music. So <laughs> uh, that, then it was like, OK, well, that means he can read like he's not a sight reader, but he can read notes. You know what I mean? So I think he does. He's from that generation, like I said, where they found their own thing. And I oh, think, they think it's cool to pretend like it's all natural. Right. And, and play the cards very close to the body. But, but no, I think he uh -huh. really. I hate that. It's like it's like hot girls acting like they're not hot. <laughs> I, right. I didn't notice. <laughs> no, I, I'd love to get him to, to talk about certain certain things that I would have loved to have talked to him about, which is, you know, some of the, the line concepts and things that uh, harmonically. What exactly is he thinking? Yeah, or even even, you know, I'm, I'm actually starting to understand more like I've deciphered some things, you know, um, just through transcribing. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it just would have been great to somehow get cracked through that. But uh, but from what I – that's what I found when I started talking to Steve and Gary is that 
if you ever tried to talk to him about music, he just he would like shut down and, and turn change the subject, you know. The most fascinating thing was controlling the playlist in the car and seeing what he liked and didn't like. I oh, was that's just cool. I was like I was like a hawk. I was just looking yeah. at his face. Dude the dude loved Sinatra. It was so funny. We kept that's, playing. That's one of my favorites. I totally, yeah. I can totally hear that. Me that's, too. And it's like, that's, and, it's like that's, and that's what I'm talking about. That's the aspect that you hear on the records, but you didn't hear live. Mm-hmm. Is that way, of, that relaxed way of phrasing melodies behind the beat and, and, and playing ballads and, and phrasing that, and melodies, you know, live, it just didn't get to that, you know, and that was yeah. something that I always wish he would have done more of live, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for, for us, you know, because in the beginning, we were really trying to, you know, we were young and stupid. We were trying to, like, it's like every choice on the iPod back in those days was, like, a serious choice with him. Because we were right. just like, I hope he really thinks right. I'm special for choosing this solo. And it's like, you know, with the culture and stuff, it's just like, ah, he's heard it. But, like, yeah. you know, the thing, like, after that died down, and it was just, like, a really solid, like, Louis Armstrong song. Or, like, you know, just, like... Astor Piazzolla, or the shit that we listened to for fun, and he was just like melting because he's like you're such a oh, yeah. so you're such a human being, you know? He's yeah, just like exactly. Well, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the stuff that I kind of wished we'd, he'd found a way to express more live. I mean, Piazzolla, yeah, some of that stuff he has has that kind of phrasing, you know, which is it's it, you just don't get it on the balls to the wall kind of fusion thing, you know. It's um, hard. Also, like the kind of gear and the kind of compression that he was running. Right. It's hard to get a real. Uh, you're playing, sure. you know, the thing that like really, I think, drew me in as a listener is. It seemed to have the proper kind of wetness that I grew up loving that a lot of the old guys didn't have. It was an easier transition from, you know, I think for, for a lot of people into jazz, because I think you know, it's very very hard to pass up on that. That's what she said, but keep going. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, It's funny. Uh, But, but yeah, I mean, it's like that kind of concept with like, you know, having that reverb and delay present and really it's jazz, but it's always painting a bigger, a difference it's it's another time that's what it really is it's like that's that's the thing that uh every generation paints a picture of a different generation there's nostalgic things in music constantly bob dylan you don't see the 60s with skyscrapers johnny cash you imagine the world of the 30s and 40s yeah you know yeah and it's like and and it, and it's true all the time it's like every generation keeps painting the generation before but it's like in a way, although Holdsworth somehow painted like another planet or something, you know. I don't know. People always say outer space aliens, but I, if if like if you actually go to Mars and it sounds like that, that'd be very strange. He's just a weirdo, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but you know, I mean, my, I guess the, that's the thing. I mean, what I always liked about him was it was this nice combination of some timelessness, but also some future thing mm. something something uh but he did that on purpose just like wayne does that on purpose and you know well he was writing the I, new I, instrument I get jocko jocko's i think jo- my my you'll see now my my dog is about this big my wife one of those small dogs and he jumps up on this this kind of high thing and then he can't get down so i gotta oh uh, yeah sure sure, sure. get this, jocko you, you guys gonna be jocko yeah <laughs> Oh, look at that guy. We need to have like a... Uh, Say hi to the thousands of fans. There we go. <laughs> We're got, we need to have like a battle of the miniature dogs. Uh, I think your, your dog would probably kill mine. How, how many pounds is that? Ten. Ten pounds of fury. Yeah, he's only eight pounds of fury. Uh, well, he's, mine's going to lose some weight for the MMA fight when we weigh him in. <laughs> but yeah, on the strict they would, diet, they would definitely have a hang. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I, I think yeah, I think I'm gonna try and get moving though. I got I got to absolutely, man. <laughs> Thank you so so much for your time. She's looking at me. She wants me to. <laughs> to do I some really, work. I, I, me and everybody here really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Oh man, and, uh, talk. Yeah, and and really, 
I'm if you ever uh, if you ever change your mind and go for like there will be blood, Jonathan Kreisberg tour. I think that's the greatest like jazz story ever told. It's well, such it's, a it's such a cycle. Well, it's, 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 yeah, it, you know it'd be fun. But like I said, yeah, you know, if, if I can ever make it out, I, I'm probably gonna try and get out to Chicago, probably to Constellation or one of these places, and you know, hopefully you can come hang. You know the. Uh, the uh, you'll, you'll hear the quartet's definitely getting into a little blood. There's, there's okay. There's okay. some bru- there's some bruising. There's well, some bruising. before you go, where can everybody find you? What's what are things to check out? Plug and I also know you have like a camp you do where you train people. Yeah, so yeah. You check that out. Yeah, yeah. So train uh, the young gladiators. Basically, we're, we're you know I I'm also doing uh the two main projects I'm on the road with these days is the quartet, and then also a duo with Nelson Veras. I don't know if you've checked out Nelson. Oh yeah. Nelson's a freak. So, yeah, we're having a great time. So we're going to Japan in a few weeks. And then uh, the quartet will have a, t- uh, a tour in the summer and then another one in the fall. And and then some, some regional United States. And I'm trying to do more more United States stuff this year. So that's one thing. Uh, I, sh- I should probably pick your brain about that after. Yes, you should. There's so many great markets. You're absolutely wrong about the States. Everybody's a hipster now, and you can get a $5 latte anywhere. Nice. <laughs> Well, cool, man. Yeah, so let's let's talk some more. But uh, but yeah, t- people can always find out at the website uh, what's happening and uh, and Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. I'm trying to trying to get my stuff together with that. Well, thank you so much. You're a legend, and thanks for being here, man. Oh man, thank you. Th- great to talk to you, man. Likewise. Bad dude too. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Cool. Talk to you. See ya. <laughs>